Honorable Minister, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Good evening and welcome to the second edition of Yadunath Khanna Lecture Series and thank you for gracing us with your valuable presence. To begin with, I have the honor to invite Foreign Secretary Mr. Bharat Raj Paudel to deliver his welcome remarks. Namaskar. Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs, Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of Nepal, Honorable Former Deputy Prime Minister and Former Foreign Minister, Honorable Members of Parliament, Esteemed Chief Secretary, Excellencies, Ambassadors and Heads of Missions, Keynote Speaker of today's event, Former Foreign Secretary and Ambassador Madhura Manacharya, Distinguished Guests, Friends from the Media, My Dear and Distinguished Colleagues from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ladies and Gentlemen. Namaste and a very good evening. It is indeed a distinct privilege and honor to welcome you all, distinguished guests, to the second edition of Professor Yadunath Khanal Lecture Series. On behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation for, and for joining us this evening. We are delighted to give continuity to the lecture series that we started last year in the name of Professor Yadunath Khanal in recognition of his outstanding contribution to the shaping of Nepal's foreign policy and diplomacy during its formative years. Overarching objective of this lecture series is to bring knowledge, expertise, experience, and insight from renowned diplomats, policymakers, professors, and researchers on diverse range of themes of international affairs and foreign policy. Through this flagship annual lecture series, we expect to stimulate informed deliberations on the issues of national, regional, and global importance that, we have, that have direct bearing on Nepal's national interest and the conduct of foreign policy and diplomacy. We hope the lecture will help better understand the dynamics of contemporary international relations and provide insights to navigate through the challenging time. We also hope that the lecture will inspire current and future practitioners of foreign policy and diplomacy to internalize the values, ideas, and ideals that Professor Kanal epitomized in Nepal's foreign policy process. Professor Kharal was born in Tanau district in August 1913 and educated in Sanskrit, science and English literature from Nepal and India. He had a diverse career as a teacher, scholar, civil servant and a diplomat. He embarked his career in diplomacy as a member of Nepali delegation to the Opera Asian Conference held in Bandung, Indonesia in 1955. Professor Khanal was appointed as, as Foreign Secretary twice in 1961 and 1967, Ambassador of Nepal to India in 1963, Ambassador to the United States and Canada in 1973, and later as Ambassador to China in 1978. Even after retirement from the active diplomatic service, Professor Khanal continued to advise the government on matters of international affairs and foreign policy. Professor Khanal demonstrated in diplomatic practice and through his writings the wisdom on how Nepal could pursue its vital. He took a lead in diversifying and expanding Nepal's diplomatic contacts and engagements. His counsels derived from his vast experience and incisive observation of international politics of his time continue to inspire and guide succeeding generations of Nepali intellectuals and foreign policy practitioners. His wisdom that country like Nepal needs to maintain clarity, consistency, credibility, and coherence in foreign policy stands as relevant today as it was in his time. Excellencies and distinguished guests, for today's lecture, the second edition of the series, we are delighted to have former Foreign Secretary and Ambassador Mr. Madhuraman Acharya, 
who will speak on the topic of safeguarding Nepal's national interest, foreign policy choices in the changing international environment. On behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to Ambassador Acharya for accepting our request to share his thoughts on this important topic. We are confident that the lecture will give us useful insights on how we may navigate in the increasingly uncertain and complex world of contemporary international relations. Ambassador Acharya does not need any introduction. He is well known among us as a diplomat, scholar, author, and as an analyst. He joined Minister of Foreign Affairs as Joint Secretary in 1996, bringing a vast experience and knowledge of working in different key ministries of the government of Nepal. He then rose to become the Foreign Secretary of Nepal from 2002 to 2005, Ambassador of Nepal to Bangladesh from 1998 to 2001, and Permanent Representative of Nepal to the United Nations from 2005 to 2009. Mr. Acharya served as Director of the United Nations Assistance Mission to Iraq in 2010 and 2011. Earlier, he also served in United Nations missions in Cambodia, South Africa, and Liberia during the 1990s. Ambassador Acharya authored several best-selling books, including Business of Bureaucracy, Nepal Culture Shift, two volumes of Nepal Worldview on Foreign Policy and Diplomacy, The Talking Points, Reflections on Nepal's Neighborhood and Multilateral Relations, and Race Against Time. I am confident that the lecture Ambassador Acharya will be delivering shortly will be interesting insightful and thought-provoking. At the end of the lecture, Ambassador Acharya will take few questions from the audience. For the efficiency of time, I request Ambassador Acharya to med moderate the Q&A session by himself. With this note, I cordially invite Ambassador Madhuraman Acharya to the podium to deliver the second Professor Yadunath Khanal lecture. You have the podium, sir. Thank you. Honorable Foreign Minister, Honorable former Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, Honorable former Foreign Ministers, Honorable Members of Parliament, Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court, Mr. Chief Secretary, Excellencies, and I see many, many distinguished colleagues uh, of mine, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I'd like to express my gratefulness to Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, and his team for inviting me to this lecture. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr. Bharat Raj Podel uh, for his kind words of introduction. Uh, but I will accept that with a little bit of disclaimer, though. Uh, I don't have profound diplomatic experience, uh, nor I have the scholarly credentials to be speaking on such a luminary as uh, Professor Yadunath Khanal. Uh, I had a brief stint in the diplomacy as a foot soldier and a humble messenger. And I sometimes occasionally write and speak on foreign policy here and there. I commend the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for initiating this lecture series uh, in, in the name of uh, our luminary of diplomacy, uh, Professor Yadunath Khanal. And Mr. Powdell uh, already explained about introduction, in his introduction, uh, explained about Professor contributions made by Professor Khanal. I don't need to dwell upon it. Uh, but uh, as uh, Professor Jairaj Acharya has, has written in his book, his uh, foremost contribution of Professor Yadunath Khanal uh, was the intellectual explanation of Nepal's foreign policy. I think he started the academic discipline of foreign policy and he represented Nepal with great distinction and dignity. And his period in Nepal's foreign policy and diplomacy uh, can be regarded as the golden era of our, of our foreign affairs, I think. 
uh, he contributed as ambassador to United States, to India and China. He contributed in strengthening relations with these countries as ambassador separately there. And he served as foreign secretary uh, during challenging times, politically challenging times, and uh, helped spearhead important negotiations uh, with neighboring countries, including India. Uh, and his uh, tenure marks uh, era of distinction and era of pride in Nepal's foreign policy. Professor Khanal used to say, we cannot communicate with the outside world effectively unless we communicate with, uh, with ourselves. I think we are doing just that through this lecture series. And I take uh, this opportunity to make, pay my tributes upon him. Personally, I didn't get the opportunity of working with him, but I was fortunate to know him. And uh, while I was living in, in a house next to his, I had occasionally opportunity to listen to his words of wisdom uh, during informal consultations and some uh, consultations when I was ambassador. I personally benefited from his uh, profound words of wisdom uh, and uh, when I became foreign secretary, uh, I started looking for uh, the experience, Nepal's experience on diplomatic negotiations. And I could find, found um, only a few references to such experiences, uh, including some from Mr. Khanal, Professor Khanal, and uh, from uh, Sardar Bhima Adhru Pandey on the negotiation in 1950 treaty. Then, uh, under the auspices of the Institute of Foreign Affairs, uh, we requested Professor Khanal and other surviving veterans of the time to narrate their experiences on how uh, they held negotiations or what are their, their experience during uh, negotiations they held with uh, foreign countries, including India and China. And, and we were able to compile a narr narration of their experiences, which uh, even today remains treasure of our diplomacy, I think. Uh, it is, uh, though it is not made public according to the uh, non-disclosure agreement that we had with them. Uh, but that remains as a big, a big treasure for us. On the subject that I'm going to speak today, uh, Professor Khanal has written and has spoken profusely on safeguarding Nepal's national interest and the need for our adjustment according to international and regional circumstances and geopolitical conditions. National interest are the raison d'etre of the foreign policy. It is the objective of our foreign policy. We should tailor our foreign policy according to our national interest. Uh, that is a well-known factor. And our constitution lists our national interest very explicitly. Uh, safeguarding uh, countries' national interest include uh, protect, uh, preservation of our independence and sovereignty, uh, our border security, our territorial integrity, uh, economic and uh, uh, security of, uh, of our people. So that is very explicit. Also, our uh, foreign policy uh, makes uh, explicit reference to uh, foreign policy 2022 of which I see the architect, Mr. Gewal, is here and during his tenure it was adopted. Uh, it explicitly mentions uh, national interest and it also acknowledges that uh, ne Nepal's national interest or country's national interest are permanent. It cannot change. Though there may be uh, priorities of foreign policy may change from time to time. I think this goes with an adage that in foreign policy there are no permanent friends, only permanent interest. Our national security policy also elaborates on our national interest, uh, and including the challenges that we have to face uh, from our open border, from our geographic location, our land lockedness, uh, from the geopolitical circumstances, and also the strategic competition between our neighbors and great powers. Uh, in the past, we defended our national interest through various instruments. Sometimes we limited ourselves, we remained in limited engagement with foreign powers. 
to safeguard our independence and sovereignty. Sometimes we engaged in wars and resistance when we were encroached upon. Uh, other places, we even adopted, our ancestors even adopted policy of appeasement to please foreign powers, to check themselves uh, from coming in. And then gradually we opened up and diversified our relations. We joined the United Nations, we joined the uh, non-aligned movement. In all these uh, movements, uh, including United Nations and uh, non-aligned movement, Professor Khanal uh, articulated and uh, represented Nepal's interest very, very well. We can see his marks in the speeches and policies of King Mahendra and uh, uh, Prime Minister B.P. Koirala at the time. Then uh, we started diversifying our relations. That's where we are here today. Uh, there are various instruments available for uh, national, uh, national, protecting national interest. Many countries uh, safeguard their national, national interest through building robust defense institutions, strong economic foundations, uh, building economic, uh, economic strength. So we should do likewise as well. There is uh, no secret about it. I think when we talk of national interest, we cannot uh, ignore our domestic considerations. In recent years, we have made significant transformation ourselves as a federal democratic republic that articulates a diverse interest of people through accommodation, inclusion, and fair play. Uh, we have made uh, significant strides in our economic development in the sense that uh, we have made uh, progress in infrastructure development, human and social development, in which our indicators are very strong. Uh, and also in, uh, uh, in making provisions in the constitution for a very progressive uh, fundamental rights provision. But we have unmet promises, promises of prosperity, promises of economic development. That, for that, we need a conducive international environment. That is where foreign policy arrives. Policy support as well as uh, international support environment is required. I think we are, uh, because we are graduating from the least developed countries uh, and to become a, a middle income country and we hope to become a middle income country by 2030, we must meet this promise with a new confidence. We should start to survive on our own feet. We cannot live forever on concessions. We need to make ourselves competitive. We need to focus on our competitive advantages. Our natural beauty, our people, our natural resources, and our location, geographic location between our uh, big neighbors who are also sources of aid, trade, uh, investment, etc., and also uh, of big markets for us. I think the foremost priority in our foreign policy should be to strengthen our relations with immediate neighbors. Our foreign policy acknowledges that fact. Uh, and uh, among, uh, among that, we should focus on uh, benefiting from them economically. A lot, lot has been said, and said about this. What does that mean? Uh, sometimes, our uh, unifier king, Prithinand Sa, said uh, some times ago that Nepal is a yam between two boulders. Dudunga Bisko Tarul. Well, if we are a yam, then we should be able to extend our uh, roots into the crevices of the boulders. We should take economic benefit from India and China. Metaphorically speaking, I would say uh, if we can we consider India as an elephant and China as dragon, we are, we are like we are between a fast-moving elephant and flying dragon. So we are in that context. I consider that we are operating as a slow-moving tortoise. Slow-moving tortoise, not even vigilant about what is happening around us. I think we can at least. It would be ideally. It would be great to invoke the gaida in us, the rhino in us to be as robust and to be growing as fast as they could. We could be doing that. But if that is not possible, we should be at least be able to be at least like a rabbit, vigilant, 
take it looking at the site quick, fast, and catch pace with them, at least economically. I think benefiting from India and China economically would require lots of things uh, together. Diversifying our trade, intensifying our connectivity agreements, bringing more uh, foreign direct investment, transfer of technology, investment, transfer of technology. So, but then we, our leaders have been reiterating uh, quite big slogans. For example, making Nepal a dynamic bridge between India and China, or land-linked economy. Or even, they are even talking about uh, ne making Nepal a transit economy. Or even trilateral cooperation between uh, Nepal, India and China. That's all good in, in slogan, but we haven't moved beyond that. What is needed in that regard, in my opinion, is we need more uh, in-depth studies, sectoral studies, which can tell us where are the benefits between, th between three of us, or how we can benefit as a transit economy. For that matter, transit economy is not just providing transit. It, I, th I personally believe transit economy is about integrating ourselves into the supply and value chain of India and China. Getting uh, into their, uh, into their uh, establishing forward and backward linkages in, in the economy. Even that, even that transit economy, for example, if we were to provide and become a transit economy, the opportunities for that may not be there forever. We have to seize the opportunity while it is still around with us. Because sometimes, uh, sometimes when they have good relations, for example, India and uh, China, if they have good relations, uh, then they may not need uh, Nepal to provide transit for them. India and China, for that matter, are not uh, ge geopolitical co uh, con competitors. They are cooperating on different, different forums. As we know, they are uh, working together on issues of development, issues of global governance, reform of the United Nations. They have similar views on climate change. They are both members in BRICS. They are, they are working together in Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. Uh, they are members in Shanghai Cooperation. So we must find a niche when they are cooperating. Also mindful that when they are cooperating, they can also bypass us. What has happened during the Lipulik uh, episode that they, their agreement in 2015 without consulting us uh, left us uh, a little bit puzzled. That can happen because we have to uh, we have to understand that sometimes when the elephants are fighting, and it doesn't matter when the elephants are fighting or mating, the grass gets cross. We we, un we we should understand that, but we should be able to get the knees out of it between their competition and cooperation. It's not always competition between them. So. Uh, in my personal opinion, some degree of healthy competition is desirable. It is in our interest. If they bring in more investment, more aid, diversify uh, trade, uh, open up with us more connectivity projects, bring rail and uh, whatever, uh, transport, uh, etc. I think we should be able to carve out a niche out of that. The second important challenge for us is to navigate or adjust ourselves in the uh, geopolitical competition, strategic competition, and big power rivalry, and even three-way contest now. That is, I mean, it used to be the geopolitical contest or a strategic competition between India and China in our region is not new, but uh, we have a third player, so-called sky neighbor. Uh, so we, we have to carve a niche out of that. We need not fear strategic competition or geopolitical context. I think what we can do is we have to uh, benefit from that. During the Cold War, Nepal was able to uh, get significant support and aid from uh, both the superpowers, the United States, America and Soviet Union. There is no reason why we cannot get advantage from uh, the geopolitical competition or strategic competition between neighbors. I think there is a room, a room for it. 
again, we don't want to be dragged into their sides, but we focus on our national interest. Sometimes our neighbors and the great powers, they bring lots of proposals for us. So, and we have experienced difficulty in resolving them or making decisions with them. Sometimes our political leaders appear divided uh, on the issues and we have difficulty in making decisions. And my personal opinion, we should uh, develop certain principles regarding such proposals because of our relations with them, because of our nature of uh, proposals that come, we, we should not be in a position to uh, say yes or no directly. We, we, cannot, we are not in a position, but if we develop certain principles and we keep re reiterating them, it makes our lives easier to make decisions on that. For example, if there is a proposal coming from a neighbor or big power, we can always say it must fit into our national interest. We cannot entertain any proposal that, is, that compromises our national interest. That is the foremost principle, I would say. Second is, we cannot compromise our core foreign policy principle, foreign policy principle, such as non-alignment. We cannot become a member of a security alliance or pact. Third most important factor, uh, principle should be, we will not be used by one or again, one against other. We don't want to be used by one power or one neighbor against other. If that is a, that clear line, we always we should always make. And in in proposals that come with a strategic and a political objective added with it, we cannot deny there are there will be political and strategic objectives. But we should carve out economic advantage. We'll focus on, we'll accept those proposals which have economic interest attached to it. And so we will, we should and we will take decisions uh, concerning economic advantage and economic beneficiality or economic uh, viability of the project rather than uh, political preferences of the country which it comes from. I think if we maintain such principles, if we maintain such clarity, our friends will appreciate as well. And not just us, because we have, otherwise if we keep delaying making decisions and without explaining. That is another area where we need to work upon. Uh, uh, Mr. Powell just mentioned about uh, the need for uh, clarity, consistency, coherence uh, and in our messages. Professor Yajdanath Khanal used to highlight that. I think we need to clear out our messages to the wider world. Because if you give confused signals, then our friends and uh, our partners will not take us seriously. You know, we have, in the past, uh, we have sometimes erred on that. Uh, but uh, in foreign policy, we cannot uh, afford to make mistakes. That is something uh, Professor Yadunath Khanal used to reiterate all the time. Because that can be costly. It can, it can compromise our national interest. It can uh, tarnish our reputation. It can, it can diminish our goodwill international goodwill that we have earned so hard. So, sometimes our leaders, they tend to make decisions or take sides based on uh, conspiracy theories, based on social media posts, or even the, their political preferences, not based on national interest. I think our leaders, they, should, they must rise above their uh, personal partisan political interest for a national interest. They must rise uh, and they must stand for national interest. There is no room for it. Sometimes our political leaders appear divided on one side or another. They cannot, they, we cannot allow them to do this. And sometimes they externalize our political issues. Externalize. Let others interfere. In that regard, uh, you know, our friends and uh, partners who are here, uh, there is always a very fine line, a small difference between helping and meddling. I know our partners and friends have good intention and they are helping us very well. But sometimes their helping becomes meddling, becomes interference. So I think uh, they, that fine line, if our partners respect, we will appreciate that very, very much. Because we cannot allow foreign inter interference in our domestic affairs. That is bottom line. It is, it is accepted everywhere. It is accepted in the Vienna Convention. It is an international diplomatic practice. So that is not something. Sometimes our leaders seek, invite, even tolerate and sometimes even invite for an interference. That I think we should, uh, we should stop. 
we live in a world that is increasingly crisis prone and a technologically evolving world. We are in the middle of a war. The whole world has seen it. We just came out of a pandemic of which our, the effect is still seen in the economic recession or uh, in the kind of economic impact. Uh, we are seeing the impacts of the uh, war in Ukraine, which has truncated supply chain, which has raised the price of fuel and uh, food products. And uh, in a situation of continuously evolving crisis, the Collins Dictionary of uh, year, uh, word of the year last year, 2020, was perma crisis, a situation of permanent crisis for which, from which there is no immediate exit. So, in all economic crisis, the, we see the world has uh, so many crises altogether, uh, the food crisis, uh, economic crisis, energy crisis. Economically speaking, uh, there is a shift from dollars to other currencies. Commercial banks are fall, falling. Many countries are under the stress of debt and some are in already in crisis. It's not just me saying, the IMF says that. Our economy fundamentals are so far strong uh, and we need not fear those, but we need to exercise prudence. We need to uh, keep guard that these crises do not cascade into our economy. We need to uh, exercise caution on public debt. We need not fear debt trap, which is the hype of debt trap, uh, debt trap I, I would say. Uh, but while selecting projects, we must, must exercise due diligence uh, in terms of economic and financial viability, the return of the project, not just uh, the political preference where it comes from. I think if we, if we maintain that, uh, we should be able to make decisions in that regard. The world is in also, we are also in a state of a climate crisis uh, from which countries like us with low income, we don't, we don't contribute a lot, but we suffer the most. Our Himalayas are melting, permafrost is melting, our glaciers are receding, our agriculture pattern has changed, rainfall pattern has changed, disasters have aggravated, and we contribute a little to it. Uh, but on our part, we are done. We have done our best, I think. For example, uh, we have a climate policy. We have a net zero announcement. We have a national adaptation plan. But the world needs to come up with a more ambitious, more robust plan. Because uh, the funding that is available for climate change is not enough, especially for uh, adaptation that we need uh, for our communities uh, who, are, who suffer from uh, climate change. I think in that regard, the government's initiative in recent uh, times to launch the Save Himalaya campaign is very welcome one. Uh, the Himalayas, they epitomize our uh, identity in the world. Uh, or they also reflect the indomitable human spirit. Uh, but the mountains in the Himalayas also are climatically changing. Uh, and uh, fragile uh, ecosystem in the world. So they need to be saved. I think in that regard, the um, Sagarmatha dialogue that the government had initiated, it would go a long way uh, if we uh, continued this commitment, uh, bringing in stakeholders to discuss on climate change. This is an area where we can speak from our experience, uh, for, from what we have done and what we have suffered. Uh, Sometimes in uh, international relations, sometimes we tend to put ourselves at the receiving end. There are no dearth of principles uh, from, from our sides because our ancient sastras and mantras, if you uh, look at them, they speak of Andariksha Shanti, Banaspataya Shanti, peace for plants. Oshadaya Shanti, they speak for lots of the climate change, they don't, we, you don't need to be taught about climate change, our ancestors were aware of these things. Even uh, the principle of coexistence, peaceful coexistence, our Buddha uh, emancipated, uh, formulated that principle, was born in Nepal. So I think uh, we need to look at these things uh, from the point of view, what, where we can contribute. Sometimes uh, we need to rise above 
uh, above our, you know, what is called uh, thinking. In the sense that, for example, when uh, our Shastras mention, our Mantras mention, Vasudeva Kutambakam, our Hindu world, Hindu Buddhist worldview regards world as one cosmic presence, cosmic coexistence. It treats everybody as everybody in the earth as a friendly existence, a friendly being. So I think we can also develop those things. But uh, it's true that we cannot continue to work on everything that is available on the earth or under the sun. Because we cannot contribute to everything from deep sea to the outer space. Though we have interest both in deep sea and outer, st st outer space too. I think wh where we should do what? I think we should uh, focus on our niche diplomacy. In areas where we have comparative advantages, in areas where we can contribute. We can speak from authority, from experience. For example, I spoke about climate, for example, peacekeeping, where we have experience for more than uh, six decades. We can speak uh, with our experience, with, uh, with our whatever wisdom we have gained from that. So we should also leverage our peacekeeping uh, to promote ourselves in the world, to enhance visibility. I'm glad the government recently hosted uh, the technology symposium with the, in partnership with, uh, with the United Nations on peacekeeping. I think we should uh, bring in more stakeholders uh, in that regard and we should uh, enhance our uh, regional peacekeeping uh, training center, bringing in peacekeepers from around the region uh, for training. Uh, we can also bring in troops contributing countries to discuss on the operational challenges such as uh, contingent owned equipment or safety and security of peacekeepers. I think that way we can, uh, we can promote, uh, promote ourselves. While uh, we talk about the contributions that we can make, we must take into account uh, the shifts that is going on international relations. International relations, uh, the conventional era fo focused on uh, sovereignty. Al although we must reiterate at every opportunity the principle of sovereign equality, but that cannot, that is not sufficient to safeguard our uh, interest internationally, because uh, the conventional, even the conventional realism or uh, national interest uh, focused competition between the state uh, is it, not working because uh, lots of principles, values, institutions have evolved. Even they are faltering. I think even the foundation of liberalism that uh, conducted international relations based on human, human rights, democracy, uh, free economy, uh, free movement of capital goods and services, even that is faltering. And we are seeing uh, an evolving world which is, which is increasingly becoming a uh, world order, which is increasingly becoming dynamic, uncertain, ungovernable, and working in absence of a theory. So I think we find, we should find ourselves in, in that, uh, that position. Uh, in that regard, I spoke a little bit of uh, big powers. I would a uh, little bit uh, draw your attention on the, uh, uh, on our neighborhood. We must also assess the global power ambitions and uh, the intentions and policies of our neighbors uh, in order to adjust, uh, bring adjustment into our policies. For example, China, uh, China is uh, not just a regional player now, it is a global player. The G7 uh, meeting recently in Hiroshima asked China to press upon Russia to end its war in uh, Ukraine. So that means the world's richest countries are acknowledged China's global diplomatic role. So China, a few uh, months ago, China had brokered a diplomatic deal uh, between, for the breaking impasse between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. So if such kind of roles of China, global role increases, that, is, that can be a beginning of new kind of world order adjustment, I think. In the short run, we should accept, expect that the China's leadership and global diplomatic issues and the Western and the US-led leadership will coexist, will run together. 
sometimes in competition, sometimes in collaboration. Maybe one U.S. official uh, is on record saying, I think, uh, that they will engage China in uh, most global pressing, incorporate China in most uh, global pressing issues, uh, and compete in economic issues, and engage constructively on security issues. So I think we must understand that China's global amb ambitions, officially so far, are uh, not political and military. They are economic, sometimes with strategic objectives led in there. I think with uh, China's new initiatives, uh, global civilization initiative, global development initiative, uh, in addition to BRI now, global security initiative, these initiatives, we have to reflect upon them whether we can find ourselves there or we can contribute to that or we want to stay away, which, from which we want to stay away. Our neighbor India is also playing a big uh, global diplomatic role. Is India is, wants to promote itself as Vishwaguru. Vishwaguru as promoting its academic supremacy, spiritual uh, enlightenment, uh, its economic power. It's currently India is uh, chairing uh, G20. And India is, uh, is moving away from its uh, traditional uh, policy of non-alignment, which, which it calls multi-alignment, where it will uh, continue to adjust its policy according to its interest and will, align, will continue more than one alignment, not just traditional alignment. And India is aspiring for a bigger role for through nuclear security group, nuclear security group and uh, security, UN Security Council membership. India currently chaired, uh, recently chaired uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So in that uh, bigger role, I think uh, it provides India an opportunity to resolve its regional issues, including its relations with Pakistan and uh, the stalemate in the SARC. Uh, in order to enhance its global role, India uh, has the opportunity to resolve the differences that exist in the region. I think in that regard, we have to find ourselves where, uh, where we can benefit, uh, benefit from these uh, global uh, or diplomatic ambitions of our neighborhoods, rather than fear it. I, I, we should not fear our neighbors' rights. Uh, sometimes we are told you, are, you have to uh, be afraid, but we, have, we should not fear it, but we should rather accommodate whatever is in our interest, not everything that they bring us, bring to the table. We should also take into account the shifts that is coming, uh, taking place in diplomacy, diplomacy as such. There is huge shift in public diplomacy. That's about convincing foreign public you, about your country or your, about your policy. Professor Yadunath Khanal uh, used to engage in foreign audience, with foreign audience in lectures and uh, write-ups. So and our uh, ambassadors should uh, continue that to promote our country or our policies in, in, in the host countries wherever they serve. Because uh, without making a favorable public opinion, you cannot get anything from that country. If you look at the media in neighboring countries in a day or two, there is so much negative comment about uh, uh, Nepal. So we should engage them, not because they are, they are not based on facts sometimes sometimes a little bit fabricated. So I think our public, we have to ha come up with a more, uh, more uh, I should not say aggressive, but more proactive public diplomacy. Social media diplomacy. It's happening, as, the diplomacy is happening in social media. For example, today, between uh, Modi and, uh, in the last two days, between Modi and Biden, everything has come up in social media. If you are not there, I don't see very many diplomats of ours in the social media being active there. The, you will be left out, they will be left out if they are not there. I think we have to engage. Though we should not make our judgments based on social media, but we should engage there. S there is uh, increasing trend for uh, personal and public diplomacy, personal and summit diplomacy. We should equip our leaders to be prepared accordingly, to deal with uh, their counterparts accordingly. Sometimes when the, uh, the other day, Ministry of Foreign Affairs invited me to, uh, for consultation as to what our Prime Minister should do when he goes to India. I told uh, Honorable Foreign Minister here, 
because of the audience I thought I should uh, share with you. We should focus on, the Prime Minister should focus on building personal rapport and dealing with issues that is required at the political level, that is required to be solved. Deal with counterpart, not bring everything on the table from on your own. I think that is what is required. We should uh, reorient our diplomats like that. Because the rest of the things can follow. If there is a trust, if there is a understanding at the political level, our diplomatic and technical levels, they can work. We have lots of mechanisms. I think that should be the spirit uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, our personal diplomacy and summit diplomacy. Because at that level, if we make mistakes, then it can be costly for us. I already uh, spoke about niche diplomacy where we can focus on issues of our com com competitive advantages and uh, expertise. We should also engage in multi-track diplomacy. Multi-track in the sense that not just between government, through informal tracks, track two. For that matter, uh, our uh, engagement with track two, a non-government organization and private sector is not as robust as this is in neighboring countries. So our government must engage in a very proactive dialogue for a constructive idea uh, to be, uh, such as this, I think. This is one of those forums. Uh, we should engage, uh, support financially them also, I think the non-government organizations that work on foreign policy issues. Uh, for that matter, we should also uh, strengthen our strategic thought. In our, we can, in diplomacy, our weaknesses in a political, economic, and a military strength we should compensate that through our diplomacy. So we, st we should strengthen our diplomacy. Investing in diplomacy, in my opinion, is investing in our national interest. It is not an extra expense. Because we, you know, we maintain very light diplomatic weight, uh, diplomatic footprint, for example. Uh, for example, uh, we have a diplomatic mission, a diplomatic relations with 181 countries just from today. But we have only diplomatic mission in 30, country, 30 countries, 40 missions for 30 countries. We are not present rest. We, we are underrepresented, understaffed, sometimes underperforming as well. So we must change that. We must change that. Our diplomats, our foreign service, for which we can regard Professor Khanal as father of foreign service because he helped establish one but could not last long. And then now that it is established, we should professionalize it, we should institutionalize it. Our diplomats need more training. I think uh, two areas, two, three areas where I think we should focus right from beginning. One is uh, we should allow our diplomats to choose careers, whether you want to go to my, multilateral or bilateral or consular affairs or economic affairs. Second is uh, they should be, for their upward mobility, uh, mandatory training is there, but mandatory diplomatic training and mandatory additional foreign language training should be required, I think. We can also allocate, say, 10% of our new entry-level post to people who have prior experience in academic institutions abroad or international organizations, so that we can bring in talents here. The government has done a commendable job in engaging the uh, NRN community, uh, forming the uh, brain, gain, brain Gain Center, uh, a few interactions, but it, comes, it should come up with more engaging partnership, more uh, imaginative ideas. For that matter, our uh, diaspora, which is now present, it, it, it claims to be present in 85 countries, and they, is, they have lots of connections, networking, resources, skills, so we should engage them. Many countries have engaged their diaspora very, very proactively and have been benefiting from them. So we should provide them opportunities for investment, opportunities for cultural exchange, opportunities for uh, a platform for uh, other action, though there is a tendency of some political uh, affiliation and sometimes uh, gaining charity work, a little bit charity work, but we need more from them. And it's, uh, I'm glad that the government, uh, the parliament has recently enacted the citizenship law which allows uh, double citizenship other than political citizenship to the NRNs abroad which is commendable, uh, welcome development. I think we should be able to carve a niche out of them to bring their investment and resources and capital and uh, their skills and networking uh, for our economic development. I think our diplomacy needs to be, uh, Professor Khanal used to speak on that. 
needs to be more creative, a little bit imaginative, I, I would say, because uh, we have no doubt of principle. We have lots of principles in our foreign policy based on national, uh, you know, our uh, interest foreign policy based on UN Charter foreign policy based on uh, non-alignment foreign policy based on Pancasila world peace. That is fine. But uh, our diplomacy and even our economic diplomacy needs to be more creative because uh, we need to focus on countries that are economically significant to us. There's a report uh, I was engaged, uh, it was submitted to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There are countries from which we receive, we receive investment, we receive tourist, we receive uh, export earning, we, we receive uh, remittances. So we should focus on those countries. Our missions, our economic diplomacy programs should be focused on that. And to uh, make our uh, diplomatic strength stronger, uh, we should invest. Uh, it, there is a proposal that uh, we should uh, earmark a certain percentage of our budget uh, for foreign affairs. At the moment, we spend less than 0.25 percent. For every rupee that we spend, we spend uh, only every hundred rupees that we spend on our national budget, we spend less than 25, 25 paisa on foreign affairs. You cannot conduct uh, diplomacy with such uh, meager resources. These countries which have comparable size and economic strength have far larger presence and strength, diplomatic strength. Is investing in diplomacy is not in, uh, in luxury, not a luxury, it is a necessity. We need to invest in our diplomacy because we need to compensate in other powers. For that matter, uh, when uh, we cannot match, uh, for example, military or economy, we can match in strategic thought. That is one of the things I keep reiterating. I'm, uh, I'm glad the government has recently appointed a national security advisor, which we are advocating, and we should help uh, uh, institutionalize this in comparison to making it comparable and the counterpart to the neighboring countries, NSS. Uh, but uh, we need, we have a strategic void. The strategic community is not as active in, in our country. If we cannot match in other powers, we can always match in strategic thought. Nobody will prevent us doing from that. So in that regard, I think uh, the proposed National Dis Defense University can uh, include a national strategic institution, which is in the proposal. I think government should support that as well. Uh, one or two words on Lumbini, uh, I would say, because uh, this is one resource or area where, where we haven't uh, been able to maximize our interest. Because Lumbini to us is a global uh, identity. Uh, and we should promote uh, Lumbini not just for uh, tourism, but as a global cultural uh, heritage. Uh, without compromising, of course, its uh, cultural values, we said we should promote tourism as well. But we should also develop as a spiritual uh, and meditation retreats, or we should uh, uh, help uh, organize, for example, interfaith dialogue there. So I think we, we can do a lot more there. For that matter, we can engage in a lot more conference diplomacy uh, because. Uh, it, we did very well as from Nepal, and I commend the, the colleagues who have done this, uh, chairing uh, the uh, least developed countries, uh, again the second time chairing least developed countries. But I think we should as proactively play a leading role in the group of uh, landlocked countries to promote our interest in landlocked uh, countries, uh, rights, and, uh, rights and development agenda of the landlocked developing countries. We should even aspire, I think, to at least chair or bring one or two meetings of the non-aligned movement and ministerial meetings and we should promote to promote our conference diplomacy. Countries smaller or uh, even in size or economic strength uh, than us have hosted those meetings. I think that is where we are uh, expanding global role rights. On broadening foreign policy choices as controversial subject but I would speak a, a word and then I will conclude uh, that. Professor Khanal uh, used to speak uh, of non-alignment, but then uh, with, he always used to stress with a bit of realism. 
with a bit of realism. He said, we should take foreign po non-aligned policy, not technically, not as a, what you call, technical non-alignment. I, I personally, uh, what he meant is not as clear, but I personally think that means that uh, non-alignment is not just technical neutrality. To me, non-alignment is pursuing an independent foreign policy. Non-alignment is pursuing your foreign policy based on your national interest. Non-alignment to me is to be making your decisions or positions based on your certain principles. Of course, non-alignment has no uh, weakness, of, no dearth of principle. It has many principles. I think uh, I think we uh, that advice still remains because in neighboring countries they have multi-alignment policies. So if we have a, without compromising our core principles, if we can broaden our choices, I think we should broaden our choice. Some countries, for example, Mongolia. Mongolia speaks of uh, third neighbor policy. Third neighbor policy uh, is uh, like us. They have two uh, traditional neighbors, uh, Russia and China, but then it has third neighbor. It has a little bit expanded to include Western democracies, including United States, uh, European Union, and also Japan uh, to help uh, diversify security and economic cooperation and to broaden their choices. Uh, and we, in, we talk of our immediate neighbors, but we also have so-called uh, sky neighbors. Uh, sometimes you know, we call the uh, United States, uh, metaphorically speaking. So I think uh, if we have to build relations with uh, big powers, uh, you know, we have to broaden our security, economic cooperation, not just with neighboring countries, but uh, broaden it in order to strengthen our security. And I think that is, uh, that is my opinion. Also, some countries uh, accept, uh, adopt hazing, which is again a controversial subject because hazing is use, uh, gain support with uh, some big powers or other, other powers than your conventional uh, friends and uh, partners. Uh, some countries have done that very, very well. Uh, there is a risk to that because it can erode your confidence from your neighbors. So we don't want to risk ourselves into such, but these options are there. So uh, we do not need to be just jinxed into conventional thinking. We should a little bit broaden our choices there. That is my, uh, my personal opinion. Uh, and uh, to conclude, uh, I would say uh, we should pursue our foreign policy and diplomacy uh, in, first of all, in an independent manner, in integrated manner, in inclusive manner, institutionalized manner, and innovative manner. It's, I will little bit explain that. Independent in the sense that we need to pursue an independent and independent foreign policy regardless of what other powers or neighbors thinks of, think, think of us. And pursuing interest-based foreign policy is we will pursue what is in our interest. Institutionalized in the sense that we should be making decisions on institutional manner. There is no, no big coordination between our institutions and policies, I must say. Sometimes our institutions and policies are working in silos. So we should integrate them, bring institutionalized decision making. For example, sometimes we let our leaders to make uh, high level contacts one to and make decisions, which is all right once in a while, but you cannot always make coherent foreign policy decisions unless you, are, you have a institutional decision making practice. Uh, that is required, I think. Also, we need to make our foreign policy inclus inclusive in the sense that we need to broaden our consultative and consensus best, because consensus has always eluded us. We have a very uncanny relations between politics and diplomacy, I must say. Our di politics uh, dominates our diplomacy. We cannot allow that. It is there, politics always conducts diplomacy. But uh, that uncanny relations, because we need to have political consensus. Uh, is Sometimes consensus is only considered as consensus between the parties in the government or major political party in the opposition. I think it goes a little bit beyond that. A consensus-based foreign policy would involve consensus not just with political actors, but also with non-government actors, the private sector, the media, the non-government agencies, track two, 
and the people in general, academia. I think we need to engage that. I think in that regard, uh, I must comment uh, the foreign ministry for engaging this kind of dialogue and allowing me to speak uh, this frankly on this, uh, on this subject. And innovative in the sense that uh, Yadunath Khanal, uh, Professor Yadunath Khanal used to say, our foreign policy needs to be creative. Creative. That means you, it, bit imaginative because you cannot, uh, I call that bicycle theory. Bicycle theory. If you do not move forward, if it's not dynamic, you cannot maintain your balance. And we talk of balanced relations. To me, balanced relation is not just equally doing exactly the same thing in two, two neighbors or powers. Balanced relation, it to me, is to conduct relations according to your interest without losing your own balance, not balancing them. Focused on your own interest, not their interest. That is balanced relation. I think sometimes even our uh, Sirsa Neta, top leaders are confused on this. They think they should do exactly the same thing with one neighbor as they do with others. I think that there uh, we need to, we need to cl clarify a little bit. The bicycle theory is we need to a uh, momentum to keep going. In foreign policy you need to drive something. Something. The uh, ideas that I mentioned above, little bit of innovation, little bit of uh, broadening. So I may help there, but this is not the final answer. So it's up to you to judge. Uh, I have taken more than I think what was allotted to me, allotted to me, and I, I hope you will bear with me. I will take some questions uh, and I will welcome comments. Uh, in that regard, uh, I would like to request to you to be uh, brief, uh, kindly introduce yourself, uh, to be brief in one comment or one question, uh, plus brief, yeah, yes, sure, because I need to be. Uh, I will go from there, please. Uh, Subanga. What is your name? Yeah, please. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful lecture. My name is Subhanga Parazuli. I'm from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, in your lecture, you mentioned that sending confusing signals from our side will result in loss of credibility among the international partners. So I'd like to ask whether this is a problem of signaling or rather a problem of strategizing. And what should be the point of intervention to change this scenario? Thank you, sir. I'll take a few more questions and in which to avoid repeats, etc. I'll uh, tackle them at the end. Please. Listening to you, uh, sir, I'm wondering whether uh, respected uh, Professor Yudhinath Kanal, looking at us from there, is uh, happy and smiling, or is he sad and to follow this up, I have uh, one question and one comment. One is from your remarks itself, it becomes clear that national interest of countries like Nepal lies not in a overly hard power centric global order, but a global order based on principles, norms, rules, and laws. If so, how many initiatives in the diplomatic history of Nepal taken by Nepal or in fact proposals made under the signature of a Nepali diplomat or a Nepali representative has been adopted by the UN General Assembly and today in force as important instruments of international law. There are two in my own knowledge, but there will be more. If so, why is the government so sad in highlighting so that they can be presented in appropriate international forum as Nepal's contribution to this new global order? Now, I just returned from my comment very extended visit to the US. And of course, the most topical worry in the people, Nepalese people there, is the Bhutanese refugee issue that has been 
as a very sad scam, highly tarnishing Nepal's global image. What, in your view, did you talk about safeguarding Nepal's image? Of course, when the discourse came up, I tried to rationalize that look, had the foreign university been consulted, this would not have taken this time. What, in your view, should we do to safeguard Nepal's highly damaged international dignity to come out in this new context? Thank you, sir. I'm Pragya Khimiri. Uh, sir, IMF recently speculated that the world could fall back into global recession due to pandemic and ongoing war, and South Asian countries could um, its economy could decline sharply. In this backdrop, how can Nepal play a role in bringing into life shark as it is defunct uh, situation right now? And our neighbor, India, seems to be very much focused on BIMSTEC and BBIN to fulfill the need of regional cooperation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yes. Bimudas, you, Raji. My name is Bimudas, former ambassador to Myanmar. Well, the topic is very interesting and very important at the same time, safeguarding Nepal's national interest. But how we define Nepal's national interest? Have we properly defined it? Because if the country develops its own national interest, in my opinion, Nepal's national interest should be based on three S. First is the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and independence. The second S is the security of our country, means both internal and external security, including border security. And the third S is the preservation of our natural heritage, sorry, cultural heritage, natural exploitation of natural resources, and preservation of archaeological, um, historical and archaeological sites. These should be the three, three important national interest for Nepal. And perhaps as you rightly say that national interest people take it differently and politicians they define or they use for national for while they implement foreign policy they do in their own way sometimes. That's why perhaps we must have a national consensus. Honorable Member of Parliament I think. Thank you, sir. I am Dhawal Samshir Rana of Parliament. Yes, yes. Nepal needs a sound economy and a national interest of foreign policies and our economic policies should be correlated and we should be taking maximum advantage of our huge economic two neighbor powerhouses, India and China. I think our economy and foreign uh, policy should be uh, correlated. I think we should think on those lines too. Thank you, sir. I'll take four more questions. I have, I have a couple of simple concerns if you receive at this hour. It is a dawning reality that Nepal has been pursuing a signature non land fund policy adhering to five principles of principle, peaceful coexistence. It is no reminder that we have been supposedly practicing tightrope, foreign policy tightrope and a balancing act in our political, economic and diplomatic engagements with our two immediate neighbors, so to say global powers, emerging India, rising China and the only remaining superpower which is stand far away America. At a time when the international geopolitical environment is under threat, 
challenging, volatile, and in a state of constant flux. There is need to navigate and walk a standard fine line when it comes to issues of neighborhood policy, MCC compact, Belt and Road Initiative, and its supplementary global development initiative. Floated in the United Nations in 2021, and subsequently, Global Civilized Initiative and Global Security Initiative now stacked up one after other. And in the context of the Russia, ongoing Russia Ukraine war, early Russia Ukraine war, and to top it all, Nepal's foreign policy options and choices are apparent shrinking and closing. Appreciate your comment, please. Thank you. Myself, Kusum Sake. I'm a board member of IFA as well. Ah, good. Uh, is there any evidence of foreign policy which reflect with changing international environment? I'd like to know some of the evidences as well. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Please. Next, uh, Hari. Thank Please. you, sir. Finally, uh, it's Hari Odari. I work in the foreign ministry. Uh, my question is a follow-up on your mention of non-alignment. And it's about uh, its semantics. Uh, in the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, non-alignment uh, had lots of political uh, concept. Uh, standing against aggression, uh, non-interference, uh, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, all, all those jargons were there. In, in, in brief, it was more of the political sentiment and less of uh, economic component. Today, even the past champions of non-alignment, uh, including in our neighborhood, they are talking and in fact pursuing what they themselves call interest-based partnership, interest-based engagement, interest-based even alliance. Uh, so const our constitution mentions non-alignment as one of the basis of our foreign policy. Uh, but the meaning uh, is it the same as 50s and 60s or has it evolved? If it has not evolved, does it serve our national interest? Thank you, sir. Please. Namaste, everyone. I am Durpada Sabkota, Under Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you, sir, for the wonderful presentation and enriching, with, uh, enriching us with your vast experience and knowledge. Um, when we talk about our national interest or safeguarding our national interest, definitely our uh, neighbors, immediate neighbors mainly, uh, comes to the picture and we spend a lot of time to talk about them. You also did today. And we talk balancing, maintaining our relations, balancing equidistance or something like that. But uh, when we exactly, do you think, is it possible if we talk uh, we just want to maintain our uh, relations with India as political and historical relations. But it is a bit different that we want uh, strategic cooperation with China and um, strengthen our relations and promote our economic uh, interest. And I have another third question as well. And you talk about today investing in diplomacy. Investing in diplomacy is investing in national interest. How do you view or how do you see the investment in our in our I mean sector, especially for the diplomats, uh, as we have been accepted as the professional generalist eyes and open of, of ears uh, of the countries. But do you think it is the government has made the end of investment for uh, in this sector? Thank you so much. Thank you, Dripadi. Uh, one last question, Irani Lal sir, oh, honourable member of parliament, certainly you. Also, I would like to congratulate you for your uh, thought-provoking presentation. My query is, is that Gurkhas uh, it is <laughs> international brand name, hmm. uh, very uh, popular, and now um, uh, Russia also interested, e in Ukrainian also interested. Uh. <laughs> so, so, so uh, we uh, think to scrap Gurkha recruitment. Uh, and joining mercenaries uh, in any country. Uh, 
So except the you know, peacekeeping forces under the UN should be allowed, uh, it should be increased, but other, it is high time um, to scrap the treaties and you know, enact the law not to, uh, citizens should not participate in any mercenaries group. They are in Gulf and different countries, declare and undeclare recruitment. So uh, it is uh, in the national interest uh, uh, to scam it and strengthen the UN peacekeeping mode. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, our basic principle non-alignment uh, uh, won't be uh, sincerely uh, applied. Thank you. I appreciate your comment. Honorable Member of Parliament. Prem Suwad, Pratini Dev Savasadasi, Nepal, North Turkey Sun Party. Mahamayam Jilai, Deri Deri Tanibad, as a Kuyo lecture Koninti. Royal Sansar, Yek Trubia China, Bau Trubia. Rio Hamro, foreign policy, my Isla Hamlet and Juno Persa. Just to Ukraine for some seven ago, America go Hatiar Rasina. Rescar and Nepal lay UN my Rus build up. मत हाले को यो असल लगने तक भी पड़ी थी। सख्ती को पसारी गर्म बने, हमरों असल लगने तक टोडी इंसान हंगलाई पसी समस्या पड़े बने संसार का तेरी देश रूले स्वयं करने चाहिए। देश का एक त्रिवेद तेरा जानू हूँ ना बहुत त्रिवेद तेरा जानू पर साल। तो सार साथ ही सही ने मोर्चा में समाप्त नौ ने हो बने, एमसीसी नेपाल ने रामरसंग को बुझने पर सो इस सब पे सही ने मोर्चा से मसल मंदिर सा डॉक्यूमेंट पर यही पन सा रह हमरों स्वाभिमान को निम्ति हमें ले वर्खा भरती लाई अब अपन नगर में पर सा रह यो पढ़ा को सिपाही वो यूएन में 1980 में यो भी से उठे कुटियो वर्खा भरती वाले को पढ़ा को सिपाही हमें कुने ही देश को लागे हमरा � हमरों राष्ट्रीय स्वार्थ को निम्ती हमरों सार्वभौमिकता को निम्ती नेपाली को सिर उच्च पार्टनर को निम्ती ये जो स्तर लाख सत्ता निभाते थैंक यू आई थिंक दिस कंप्लीट्स द फर्स्ट राउंड ऑफ क्वेश्चंस आई रियली अप्रिशिएट योर क्वेश्चंस एंड कमेंट्स आई एम ग्लैड आई स्किप्ड सम ऑफ द पर्सन्स ऑफ माय लेक्चर you will be getting the written lecture. Uh, I skipped some of uh, some portions from my lecture because I knew there would be questions coming in uh, on shark, on multi multilateral policies, on uh, political controversies regarding recent uh, moves, Bhutanji uh, refugee scam. Uh, these issues I left intentionally because I, I I was sure there would be questions coming in. Uh, I would begin with a small, uh, on a lighter note, whether you would want to, still want to be a tortoise or turtle rather than a rabbit. I think our ancient wisdom, or Panchatantra Nidhi Katha says, if a tortoise and a rabbit runs the race, tortoise will win. You know, I don't want to challenge that uh, Nidhi Katha, but I think uh, we need to be a little bit cleverer vigilant, looking at uh, all sides equally, you have a point, total lives longer, I can always agree with you. Uh, but uh, I, my intention was to, we need to be more vigilant, more fast to be able to catch pace with them. Uh, you cannot win the race through Panchatantra Nidhi Katha, I think. Uh, I'm glad you also raised uh, the questions that I mentioned briefly about technologically evolving world, but I uh, did not have time to explain it. You know, we are in the uh, middle of the fourth industrial revolution. The world is confused about what to do with science and technology. There is a warfare on technological supremacy. There is a, there is a competition on uh, how to use or even the challenge of artificial intelligence the uh, integration of technology including 3D printing, robotics, automation, uh, you know, nanotechnology or 5G telecom, uh, even uh, blockchain. So I think uh, in my lecture that uh, will be distributed to you, I have proposed that government should 
assess the technologically evolving world in continuously and establish a technology resource uh, resource center so that we protect ourselves from the any sinister ex accidental harm from the technology at the same time uh, seeking to benefit what lies in us from there from the how we can benefit that technology because we don't want to be left out that is in my lecture thank you for pointing that out on the question honorable member of parliament uh, i'm glad you asked this uh, also i have dealt with uh, issue of multipolarity and our multilateral diplomacy where it where it, we need to fix it uh, we it is in our interest to have a multipolar world uh, to uh, interest to promote multilateralism at the core of our policies because we crave for uh, non discrimination we want common and differentiated responsibility we want equitable geographical representation there's lots of principle for us because that is how the world is conducted because our interest lies in promoting a uh, global multilateralism which is layered which is based on uh, principle of subsidiarity whatever is available for us regionally should be available there if it's not available regionally it should be available to uh, from international institutions un and other international organizations so we should strengthen our multilateral diplomacy and we should promote multipolarity and we sh this is something we celebrate and not fear about it thank you for raising that uh, honorable uh, irene lal sister thank you for asking that question uh, my response uh, with that regard would be if not the gorkhas other uh, lots of security companies gorkhas at least they are being hired through an agreement that we have so we need to work uh, on those agreements with the respective governments to negotiate as something the government has initiated a process so that must, must reach to a logical conclusion but uh, on the other area we need to really work upon and improve is that lots of security companies are hiring our people ex, ex gorkhas or people as security guards and building them in combat positions i saw that in iraq and uh, some times ago our people were killed in afghanistan they were doing uh, formerly done by the uh, military uh, the jobs doing done by the military so we are sending people in security jobs exactly in the same manner through a labor permit as we send people to uh, look after ship in uh, saudi arabia we cannot do that we should have a separate set of agreement for allowing our security our people to work in security companies private security companies who are hiring uh, our people uh, i think that is the case uh, that is evolving that is that is in the news nowadays uh, rather than government allowing them but we have allowed certain uh, labor permit system that we must change for labor permit system security guards who are going there they will benefit but not for the combat jobs if they are going combat jobs it, it is in our primary uh, responsibility the government who can be responsible for our citizens they are working abroad they are drawing abroad in uh, war like conditions so we must protect so we need to have a separate set of agreement i can speak of that on gorkhas of course uh, there is no point of denial what you state but there is a process and the government is engaged in that i am sure this is not for me the, to answer but the government i'm sure the, it will come um on our issues uh, on, on with neighbor neighborhood uh someone mentioned issues with neighbor, neighboring countries uh, i think we need to in order to have the best relations we need to resolve the outstanding issues with our neighbors that being very particularly with india uh, we need to have a respectable framework of relations through uh, review of 1950 treaty resolve the boundary issue uh and through including through the logical conclusion of the epg process i'm glad to see uh, one of the eminent members sitting here with us dr bhagwadu thapa that should uh, end in a logical conclusion through that uh also with china uh, we need to find a way uh, to resolve uh, for example to implement the bri project because nowadays uh, there's a lot of confusion whether what is bri or what is not bri for example chinese are saying the pokhara airport is bri something else is bri so we need to find a way out to without creating mistrust between them so we need to have a clear communication with the chinese and the both sides should be speaking the same language rather than saying we said this is not bri they are they are saying this is bri i think they are uh, we need to work out uh, work out a little bit on that
because these are uh, unresolved issues and boundary disputes uh, can have a, a lot of different problems. Uh, we, we saw the Doklam stand of the Galwan Valley crisis. Uh, it can complicate into a regional crisis as well. Uh, someone mentioned about uh, uh, global recession. Yes, I mentioned a bit and a bit explained in the lecture. Uh, that the world is, the World Bank says, the world is starting in the beginning phase of a yet another recession. Uh, so economically we are facing a very challenging time, so we should uh, be cautious and adapt ourselves accordingly. Uh, how can SARC be brought back? This question I left intentionally because I'm sure someone would ask it. Uh, in the past, when there was deadlock like this, uh, we invented lots of instruments. Uh, we held uh, the consultation visit of uh, because we are the chair, we are the host of the secretariat. So we uh, took our prime minister to SAR capitals for consultation, asking them what do you need to do with this SAR? Is it this like this? We are living this forever. Then second is we can uh, start consultation at the uh, ministerial or uh, secretary level or even a host a special meeting. We hosted a special meeting of foreign secretaries uh, when there is an environment is conducive and it was, if terrorism is a problem, my personal opinion would be we should host a meeting on regional security, bring all the countries together and discuss what needs to be done in terrorism because uh, he, without having talking together coming into the same platform we cannot uh, do because uh, we cannot uh, withhold the SARC process, SARC process, because of the initial euphoria was there, but it is in limbo now. So, and we cannot uh, keep on uh, working on other alternatives, uh, killing SARC uh, before. So we need to revive it. Uh, I think we need to find a way out. I think uh, on behalf of the uh, chair, Nepal uh, has some responsibility, I think, to at least initiate a few consultation visits or few uh, send secretary general or, or invite a special meeting or invite a special meeting of foreign secretaries. We can do a lot in that regard. On the refugee scam, uh, I also again left intentionally. Uh, our uh, Nepal is in the international radar already on a number of things. Uh, we have unresolved issues from the uh, transitional, of the transitional justice uh, for unresolved cases of human rights violation in pros disappearances that we are to conclude through the process of truth and reconciliation uh, in accordance with our uh, peace accord and the constitutional provisions, which we have not completed. We need to, we need to act upon that to convince our international community. Our indicators on governance, on corruption, on doing business. Lots of uh, indicators we are ranking, rank really low. We need to work upon them. And these, uh, Professor Yadunath Khanal used to say, our internal corruption erodes our international personality. That is, he is in record said that. So we must work on this uh, fake Bhutanese refugee scam to bring everybody uh, to the book through due process of law as not through political activism. For that matter, someone mentioned about, uh, uh, I mentioned, I left that issue as well. You know, we have seen uh, nowadays, sometimes if we delay our diplomatic action, the space will be taken over by political activism. We have seen that. If you, you delayed sending one, we delayed sending a note uh, on certain somebody, uh, dies on a, uh, disappears on a river and at the border, border river because a, a bridge is uh, cut off or a, a, a part of Nepal appears in the map of another country's parliament. So we need not delay diplomatic action. In issues that needs diplomatic action, we cannot allow political activism and populism to take place. That will erode our international personality, our, erode our friendly personality. And we cannot allow the actors that are not entitled constitutionally to act on foreign policy issues themselves. They, I think that is what is happening. That I, I deliberately left it because someone would ask this question. So, uh, yes, sending a note, for example, if something happens, okay, sending a note, we want uh, your attention, we are information from you, it does not harm. I think sometimes we are a little bit constrained, a little bit uh, too much hesitant to take uh, some action. 
uh, I think uh, that is promoting, that is leaving space for political activism and populism. You know, for that matter, the world as a whole, internationally, there is a wave of populism and nationalism. We cannot allow those waves to cascade into our politics as well as into our foreign relations. I think that, that would be my response of that. If I left something. Udasji, thank you for uh, explaining a little bit in a different way, but the Constitution already explicitly mentions that, what are our national interests. Uh, and uh, on resource security, I have in my lecture, because in the interest of time I could not elaborate on it, we should uh, use our resources prudently. Water, for example, is our strategic resource. And it can be used as a, uh, as a springboard for regional cooperation, but also can help uh, reduce our uh, trade deficit, bring our import bill, fight climate change. That I have a little bit uh, discussed in the lecture as well. Thank you for raising that again. Did I leave something else? Yes, uh, Paraji, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, uh, Honorable Sujata Madam, I will come back to you. Uh, thank you for uh, great power rivalry. You know, we do not want to be happy. You know, as he says, a new Cold War or a new so-called Thucydides trap, that if, uh, if another power challenges the existing power, then the war will be inevitable. We don't want that situation. But we want to, uh, uh, we want to save ourselves. We don't want to be dragged into the big power competition. I think that should be uh, our, our policy in that case. Uh, and uh, I mentioned also in my lecture that we need, uh, apart from having best relations with our uh, neighboring countries, we need a neighborhood policy of our own. Our uh, friends, neighbors, and big powers keep coming with lots of initiatives. They have uh, South Asia policy. South Asia is in a hot spot because of the uh, relations here, big power interest here, situation in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, standoff between uh, uh, countries. So, uh, I, for that regard, we need a neighborhood policy with our own initiative. Sometimes we have not even responded uh, and been able to respond very well to neighborhood policies of others. We cannot relegate our neighborhood policy to a, just a footnote of foreign policy. We need a full place. I think in that regard, uh, foreign policy, if when there is an opportunity to review it, I think we need a full place neighborhood policy. Uh, rather than just clubbing everything into bilateral relations and immediate neighbors. And we, we have an extended neighborhood, we have regional cooperation, we have BIMSTEC. For example, we, we joined BIMSTEC, hoping to join uh, the Bay of Bengal, hoping to benefit, to be, uh, benefit uh, the region of uh, South East Asia, connecting South East Asia, uh, and we're hoping to benefit from, from it because there would be no political differences and progress would be faster there. But somehow the, uh, the train did not move. It's really slow. Uh, so we need to find a value addition from there, from Bimstake and, uh, you know, and in regional cooperation, we need to focus on and move beyond a little bit. We need to move beyond uh, little, few, trade, few trade agreements and unimplemented declarations and intentions. We need to have more economic corridors, more connecti connectivity driven uh, projects. For that matter, we should, Nepal should have our own connectivity blueprint, I think how we can benefit from our neighbors, how we can economically benefit from them, how, can, how we can integrate or extend our supply to their value and supply chain, like I mentioned. Now, the last point uh, I wanted to mention, nobody raised a question, but I didn't want to leave it. Nobody raised a question. This is about uh, how we treat our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There have been instances where foreign ministry is, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs have been bypassed. You cannot have best foreign policy decisions when your institution interested for that is bypassed. There are many, look at the MCC or SPP. If foreign ministry, if foreign ministry, foreign ministry, you cannot bypass foreign ministry. Foreign ministry should always on the lead. If not in the lead, for example, sometime in sectoral matters, it should be in the loop. There have been instances where we have bypassed foreign ministry. And uh, in order to make institutional decisions, uh, sometimes we, these kind of errors we must correct. Honorable uh, Sujata Madam, please, you wanted to ask. Thank you, Madam Ramanji. I'm happy to be here. 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 I'm happy to be
पुराएर सुन्दा केरे तेरे कामरो पुराएर तो पहले सजेशन हर दिन वो बोलने वो हमला करता हूँ वो इधर बांधने लायक हो चाहे तो मेरा धन्यवाद पनी चाहे राव मेरो ये उटा पूरा मलाई स्ट्राइक करे तो पहले जो नेशनल इंटरेस्ट को पूरा बार बार उठाऊँ वो तो नेशनल इंटरेस्ट को मलाई ये उटा मंत्री मलाई तो पहले सोचने चाहे ये बीआरआई को बनी अली प� I a little bit mentioned in the beginning. I think uh, these proposals that come from our neighboring countries or big powers, they have their interest embedded in it. It's basically their proposal. Sometimes they have political objectives, sometimes they have economic objectives, so we cannot rule out strategic objectives. But we must look into these proposals seeking to carve economic benefit out of it. If there is an opportunity, to enhance our relations through BRI, if there is an opportunity to connect the missing links between China and Nepal, if there is an opportunity to bring in more investment, if there is an opportunity to in expand our trade, bring in more tourists through BRI projects, why should we hesitate? Of course, we don't want to be dragged into uh, security-oriented strategy-oriented projects or projects in which we will be uh, trapped into debt. But it's project to project. I think we should, uh, it's something for the government to describe. But my personal opinion is we should judge the projects based on their economic and financial viability, not on the political preferences where it came from. I think in that regard, BRI offers good opportunities for us. Uh, for that matter, India has a neighborhood first act east policies. United States has uh, its uh, MCC. So I think uh, in my lecture I mentioned, Madam, uh, that whenever there are opportunities like that, we need to seek economic benefit from them without being dragged into their sides, without being dragged into their competition. That's a tough task, but nonetheless can be done. We have done in the past. With that few words, I would like to conclude my uh, lecture. Uh, thank you very much for bearing with me. Uh, and thank you for your, all your questions and answers. Uh, and once again, thank you, uh, Mr. Fornifes, Bharat Raji, Honorable Foreign Minister, uh, Rita Ji, other colleagues. Thank you very much as well. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'd like to extend our sincere grat appreciation to keynote speaker, Mr. Madhuraman Acharya, sir, uh, for the stimulating lecture, and also the audience for their active in engagement. We saw a lot of interest, uh, but because of the time, we had to uh, come to a conclusion. Uh, may I now request Honorable uh, Foreign Minister uh, N.P. South for uh, delivering his remarks. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to all, you all. I am delighted to see honorable justices, former ministers, member of parliament, diplomat, officials, scholars, media and civil society representatives joining, joining us for this second edition of Yadunath Khanal Lecture Series. Your valuable presence testifies the significance of this event. I am confident that YNK lectures will continue to serve as an important platform for sharing ideas, stimulating thoughts, and broadening our understanding on the evolving issue of our time. As we just heard from Ambassador Madhu Raman Acharya, this year's lecture focused on the theme of safeguarding national interest and the policy choices that we have a contemporary international environment. As a seasoned practitioner of international relations and diplomacy and an author in the field, Ambassador 
Madhuraman Acharya made in depth coverage of the topic and suggested some practice, practical ways on how we work in today's complexities. Safeguarding national interest is paramount for every country. This is something which cannot be compromised under any circumstances. The constitution of Nepal has broadly defined our national interest. Foreign policy is the tool in pursuit of these interests. In our part of the world, we grew up listening to the stories from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, teachings of the Buddha, and the tenets of Chanakya Niti. These treasures are full of knowledge, wisdom, and insight on statecraft and diplomacy. The worldview presented therein is a fine blending of values and pragmatism. Thanks, thanks to, to the wisdom, vision, and pragmatism of our predecessors, in predecessors, Nepal maintained its independence throughout the history and continued its engagement with the wider world. Late Yadunath Kanal was one such towering figure unmasked in the magnitude of wisdom and the level of judgment. Today we are equally aware that our ability to influence international politics through military economic means is not viable. Diplomacy therefore continues to remain the only available tool at our disposal. This was the crux of Ambassador Acharya's luminous speech. Nepal is situated between two big, powerful, and fast-growing economies of the world, India and China. We seek to maintain friendly relations with both of them based on the principle of sovereign, sovereign, sovereign equality, mutual respect, cooperation, and mutual benefit. We seek to process prosper by being better connected to both sides of our neighborhood in economic terms. We also value our relations with our extended neighbors, development partners, and destination countries for our migrant work workers as well as all over, the con all over other countries of the world. Our foreign policy is based on non-alignment Panchasil and principle enshrined in the UN Charter. Non-alignment should not be interpreted in its narrow terms and understood as indifference. We carry out a close and careful assessment of the developments taking place in the world and respond to them considering their merits. Our efforts are directed towards enhancing the dignity of the nation by expanding our role in the international arena. Through membership in the ECOSOP, Human Rights Council, Peace Building Commission, and the Chair of LDC Coordination Bureau in the United Nations, Nepal is playing an active role in the global forums. Dear friends, the world is witnessing rapid change this has made the formulation and conduct of foreign policy made more dynamic and complex. Identifying the global trends which, which may shape the global geopolitical, economic, and social systems in the coming decades is a strong imperative. We need to analyze and understand these changes, assess their implication on us, and fine-tune our response, keeping national interest and welfare of the people at the center. Furthermore, foreign policy today has to deal with challenges, such as climate change, financial, food and energy crisis, pandemic, mass evacuation, and repatriation of population, transnational crimes, cyber security, terrorism, and so forth. Therefore, capacity development of our human resources is crucial to be able to cope 
with the challenges of the 21st century. A, a large segment of our population is outside the country. Our focus is on protection and promotion of their rights and welfare abroad as well as keeping them connected to the homeland. With the settlement of political process at home, our priority has now shifted to attaining economic development and prosperity for all our people. Our aim is to achieve economic progress, including by pursuit of effective economic diplomacy. We are focused on expanding partnerships and international cooperation in priority areas. Economic, economic agenda has received due importance and priority in our engagement with immediate neighbors and friendly countries as evident in the Prime Minister's recent visit to India. National consensus is essential for success of foreign policy and its, and its credibility. All political parties need to be on the same page when it comes to the fundamentals of our external engagement. Such consensus will bring clarity of our goals and consistency in our priorities. Therefore, during my tenure as Foreign Minister, my sincere report will be towards this end. Excellencies, distinguished guests, before I conclude, I would like to extend special thanks to Ambassador Acharya for his highly engaging, comprehensive and enlightening presentation. I would also like to thank the participants for their comments and thoughts during the Q&A session. Let me also extend sincere thanks to Professor Jairaj Acharya for his contribution as an expert member in the steering committee that is mandated to guide the process of this lecture series. Foreign Secretary, Foreign Secretary and other colleagues in the ministry who have worked hard to bring this lecture to you also deserve my compliment. As we leave this hall today, I remain optimistic that there is a plenty to reflect upon what is best for our country. We look forward to seeing you again in 2024 with yet another insightful lecture on a topic theme. I thank you once again, Jai Nepal. We express our deepest gratitude to Honorable Foreign Minister for the inspiration, guidance, and support provided to us in bringing this event. Uh, it is my great honor now to invite Mr. Madhuraman Acharya uh, to receive a token of our appreciation. May I also request Honorable Foreign Minister to hand over the plaque and, uh, uh, and also request Foreign Secretary to, to join them. We will now have a few official photographs. May I request Honorable Minister, Foreign Secretary, and uh, our keynote speaker to be in the front once again. And also uh, Mr. Uday Raj Khanal and Mrs. Sarita Khanal to join them. May I request uh, our former Foreign Ministers, uh, Chief Secretary, and uh, Justices of the Supreme Court and Members of Parliament also to join in the next round of pictures. I'd like to request our former foreign secretaries also to join the official photograph. With this, the second edition of YNK lecture series comes to a conclusion. The hard copy of the lecture is available and can be picked up from the registration desk outside the hall. The lecture will also be uploaded in, in the ministry, ministry's website and also in YouTube uh, of MOFA. I request our guests to proceed for the dinner in the Manjari Garden on my left. And thank you and have a great evening. <laughs>